change the uh, wastewater moment that I had advocated for to be wastewater educational moment uh, to make it more clear that our intent is to um, provide education materials as we go forward on, on wastewater. And this week, we, I asked Paula uh, Champagne to come in, our health director, um, to give us some information on what septic systems are and how they work and, and what they do or don't do to, to uh, help us with nitrogen um, and maybe a few other things that she has on her website. So, Paula, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for taking the time with us this evening. Thank you. Hopefully the computer will work and the screen will come up. Now oh, here it goes. It's getting there. Well, uh, the presentation tonight may seem a little bit rudimentary to a lot of us that have been working on the committees for several years. It's always important to remember that every year we have a certain percentage of new residents in town and our visitors. And for the first time, it's probably the first time that they've ever had a septic system. So um, it's important that as we go forward on this, on this discussion that we're all going to be having the next several years that we understand, we all um, understand a little bit more about septic systems 101, what's out in your backyard, what it does, what it doesn't do, and um, hopefully answer a few uh, questions and dispel a few myths. Uh, septic System 101, if you live on the Cape, about 90% of us all have this, some form of this, out in our backyard. Um, and that is, I, I can relate a lot of stories about early in my career, someone calling and saying, I needed to send out the DPW because the pipe had burst out in their backyard, not even knowing that they had a sewer, that we weren't on a sewer, that they had a septic system. So this is a conversation that we have frequently as to uh, where the, where the uh, mystery of what goes down the drain. It goes into your backyard. Uh, we are on our own, we have our own private utility in our backyard called a septic system. The history of septic systems, there's a history for everything. Uh, if you grew up in the city um, hundreds of years ago, the preferred method of disposal was to take the chamber pot and throw it out the uh, window into the street into the catch basin. So if, if you've had the opportunity to travel through Europe and lovely old villages, mm -hmm. um, we are very lucky that we weren't traveling around those same lovely cities two or 300 years ago. The stench was unbearable. Disease uh, was a very common way of life. Um, the, the, as I say, the, the slop buckets, everything went out into the sewer. The little boy looking at what looks like some lovely pottery, there's actually a chamber pot museum. A chamber pot was a <laughs> fixture in every household, and uh, those, those are not soup terrines. That is a chamber pot museum. Then if you were lucky enough to get out of the city, uh, you had that modern convenience out in the backyard uh, known as the outhouse. The early systems were called cesspools. It was a one-size-fits-all, um, and we actually can find historic references back to the 1400s of the first cesspools being installed. They were originally just holding pits. They did not leach, and so people came and cleaned them out. The old, you know, if you hear references to night soil, that's what they were coming in and cleaning out the muck from the cesspool. Uh, they were widely used until the 1960s. And at that time, we went to our more modern convenience of the septic tank, which separates, which is some rudimentary um, settling and separation of the waste. There's actually a patent for a septic tank. It was issued in the 1880s in France. Um, but as you'll see and learn to understand, there really hasn't been a whole lot of advancement in the way that we treat our waste if we're talking about septic tanks and septic systems. Uh, this is what's called the old beehive cesspool. There's still a lot of these on Cape Cod. Uh, we are blessed on Cape Cod with beautiful, beautiful soils, and a uh, septic system can last. You know, I've, I've seen cesspools 100 years old because of our wonderful sandy soils. The object of a septic tank, septic system, is to take the waste out of the house and put it into the ground. It was a great public health achievement which took the waste off the street, removed disease, and put it underground. It doesn't do a heck of a lot more than that. There is very little reduction in chemistry, very little reduction in pollutants. 
Our current Title V, you'll hear Title V, that's the code reference for the State Sanitary Code of Massachusetts, which is our code of regulation for the design and installation of septic systems. So Title V is, is the lingo. A current Title V septic system is really a two-component system. The waste lines, the sewer lines come out of your house from all of your different fixtures, feed into a main sewer line that then goes into the septic tank. A septic tank is a 1,500 gallon tight concrete box, which is a settling system. From there, it is watertight. From there, it feeds on gravity. Uh, the effluent from that uh, septic tank will then go into a distribution box, which will then distribute, disperse it into some sort of a leaching facility, which then trickles down into the ground. It is, uh, that, that's it, it's, it's very simple. It is gravity fed, unless you have issues with groundwater and you need a pump or um, trying to pump the um, effluent to another portion of your property. Very, very simple system. A septic tank, how does it work? Again, it's a, it's a 1500 tight concrete box. All of the waste comes in. It's designed, the scientific design to this is that a drop of water going into the septic system will take about 24 hours to travel through the system and go out. A septic tank is, is on dispersion. Um, five gallons in or five gallons out. It's, it's, a, it's a very um, non-mechanical system. The time that it spends in the septic tank, this is a microbiological system. Mm -hmm. The uh, microbes in there will break down solids, soaps, grease. There will be, it's food for the bacteria, it's a biological system, it's not a mechanical system. And in the presence of oxygen, will transfer some of the components, mostly just to a stable situation. There is virtually no reduction in chemicals, um, pollutants that go in, which is why we try to train people not to put their medications, um, oils, turpentine, gasoline, things like that shouldn't go into your septic system because this is just a conduit for it to go into the groundwater. So that's how a septic tank works. Uh, the sludge builds up on the bottom of the tank, settles out. It, the siphons come out of the liquid range. The scum, the oils are on top. Uh, one of the questions was, where do the soap bubbles go? Where does the grease go? It's right here in this, in this chamber. And um, it is the the effluent that then gets carried off to the um, leaching facility. So, Paula, just so I had that, that slide up there, people often ask the question, how often or when should I get my system pumped or when do I need to pump it? You should pump What's your the indication system. sort of thing to them or is there an indication to them? You should pump your system uh, every three to five years. Okay. And the pumper will tell you whether, oh, you waited too long or what's a good cycle. Even if you, there are studies that have come out in the past year that, that's, that say, oh, I didn't, the solids didn't build up, I was there weekends for 10 years. Well, the solids may not have built up, but it's turned into cement, and you're going to pay more for them to come back in with the backhoe, and not the backhoe, excuse me, to pressure wash. They cannot get the solids out. It will turn very, very solid, and, and um, it's very difficult to pump the system. And so for good maintenance, every three to five years. And how about some of these, I'll just call them chemicals or things, additives that people either talk about or they sell that you can supposedly put in your, you know, just dump it down the drain and something magic happens in your septic tank? Um, something magic will happen. About the only thing that we would recommend or um, not have an issue if you are using something biologic. Some people feel as though they must add biologics to their system. It's really not necessary. There is so much bacteria going into the septic system from all of the daily uses that it usually has enough bacteria to keep it going. Okay, so it really um, doesn't do any good. To it really doesn't do any stuff. good. Uh, there are biological and enzymes that are added in commercial facilities that help to reduce the amount of, of sludge and fat and grease build yeah, up. Okay. It's not necessary in a, in a residential situation. Okay. Thank you. And we definitely do not advocate using any of the degreasers that were yeah. common years ago. Again, those have been shown to pollute uh, quite a bit of groundwater. Okay. Your soil absor absorption system, 
Most of the systems now are um, perf pipe or very shallow systems which are high to the surface. Uh, this changed in 1995. Previous to that, most of you will have a six foot leaching pit surrounded with stone, uh, a catch basin type system out there, uh, which, which had very, very long lives, again, in our wonderful soil. But it was found that keeping the systems higher to the ground does help with some evapotranspiration. So most of, most of your leaching facilities, again, this is a conduit to get it from the septic tank into the ground and dispersed, are these flat pipe and stone systems, or you may see some plastic chambers. So your septic system treatment features, again, it's designed for public health. It, it is an excellent feature. It was one of the vanguard moments in, in public health in history, taking the sewage off of the sidewalk and putting it in the ground where uh, we were able to eliminate a lot of disease. It's not designed for environmental health purposes, and that's the reason why we're having problems with our estuaries and our ponds. Um, it, there is very minimal treatment. It is only primary settling. There is limited chemical removal and reduction. The um, septic systems, uh, if they're located in good soil, such as ours, the area below the leaching facility is very good for bacterial removal. Again, a lot of your public health factors. Get the sewage off the street, it does eliminate uh, bacteria. Most bacteria, if given four or five feet of good, clean soil, most of the bacteria will be removed and a lot of the viruses. But nothing for um, chemicals. We're seeing a lot of studies in groundwater. We're seeing a lot of um, drugs, the pharmaceuticals, the endocrine disruptors showing up in our groundwater. A lot of the chlorinated hydrocarbons from the years of uh, use into our septic systems. Minimal amounts, but it's still making our way into our groundwater. Oh, I just so you had that slide up there, the previous one. Sorry. Um, would you just explain what a perk test is? So, because that's another phrase that some people probably don't know, but you hear it a lot. Perk test. Okay, a perk test, that is the start of needing to put in a new septic system. It's called a percolation te test or a deep hole test. That's if you need to have a new septic system put onto your property, you make an appointment with us, your engineer. We go out and do the soil and site suitability. There is a 10 foot hole done with a backhoe measuring the distance to groundwater and also doing a soil stratification to make sure that there isn't any clay or peat or um, soils that will not accept a leaching facility. And, what, and what's your minimum uh, distance to groundwater? The code requires five feet below the bottom of the leaching facility to the maximum adjusted groundwater. Okay, thank you. Uh, some of the issues that we're dealing with with wastewater issues and the need to uh, take care of are nitrogen and phosphorus coming from the septic systems, there is very, very minimal reduction in nitrogen and virtually no reduction in phosphorus. And this is what drives our uh, ecological systems. Mm -hmm. uh, think of nitrogen and phosphorus just as you do on your lawn, they're fertilizer. But in the environment, it is called the uh, limiting factor. It's, it's the food that makes the algae um, have a holiday. And in salt water, it is nitrogen. Nitrogen is what sets off, what tips the balance in the ecosystem and causes algae blooms. And in our freshwater environments, it's phosphorus. That's very important to know the difference. You're not gonna treat uh, nitrogen around a freshwater pond if you're having huge algae blooms and vice versa. You need, so you need to apply the technology and the treatment uh, properly in those areas. Nitrogen removal. Ammonia, where does it come from uh, in your septic system? The nitrogen <coughs> comes from ammonia, which is in the biological waste. The ammonia in the septic system is stabilized through oxygenation and is converted to nitrates. Once the, all of the ammonia is converted to nitrates, it's very stable in the environment. And again, we put this wonderful conduit so that it leaches down into our groundwater, makes its way into our groundwater, and travels with the groundwater until it immerses in another water body system. Domestic wastewater, the literature will show you that uh, coming out of a uh, septic system is about 35 to 40 milligrams per liter of nitrates. A septic system, um, 
the CDM report gave a very generous 20% reduction. That's pretty high. You usually read a lot about 10, 15%, but even so, it's still, you're still only reducing that uh, nitrogen down to somewhere in the 30 range. Um, the, our comprehensive wastewater management plan illustrates that we need to move 70 to 100% of the nitrates from septic system in our coastal embayments to return those to fresh, productive um, environments. What does that mean? What do those numbers mean when you keep hearing about all of that nitrate? Our drinking water standards, the EPA drinking water standard is 10 milligrams per liter of nitrates. If you have more than that in a, a water supply, it's unsuitable for drinking water. On the Cape, through our years and years of testing, we know that the background level, the unaffected level in our, in our aquifer is less than one part per million. So even if we start to see if we've, we're tracking water supplies and we're starting to see five, six, you know you're still below the EPA number, but you also know that you've influenced it mm -hmm. from agriculture or septic systems, runoff, whatever. In the marine environment, less than one milligram per liter. It's, you have a very sensitive environment of what you need before you start upsetting the balance there. And that's because um, animals, water life are living in that environment versus drinking. So the, the um, upsetting the balance is very critical. Linda. Question back. If the Ammonia has been stabilized and converted to nitrates. Why is it still a problem? Um, it is the, the nitrates, which are then used by the plants, which can convert it back to nitrogen. I'm just asking the question to make sure that as we talk about newcomers to septic systems, when you use a word like stabilization, and then why does it? Why is it still a problem if you've stabilize it so it's because the plants convert it back and then you get the yes yes um, this is from the comprehensive wastewater management plan which just shows that they are attributing title five systems only reduce 20 percent you need to go all the way over to the right hand corner for patch package and central treatment plants which are effective at removing 90 percent of the nitrogen and then they've looked at the different embayments saying how much nitrogen they need to remove to get back to a healthy environment. Uh, there was a question about what about composting toilets? If you're not releasing that into the environment, isn't that going to solve all of our problems? Um, some people think that we should be promoting composting toilets. I think composting toilets have a place in society. I don't think that the place, uh, according to public opinion, is in everyone's home right now. It's not really a mainstream kind of uh, technology. I'm sure we've all seen them in the, in the uh, national parks, visitor centers, etc. cetera. Uh, first of all, it is what, exactly what it says. It's a toilet uh, that uh, reduces the amount of, of water flow. There's virtually no water going into a system. It's not being carried out into a septic system. Uh, this is a, a, this system requires a, a large holding tank, usually in the, in the basement, where you are composting your own waste in your home. It takes probably, um, you can, it depends what model you use, how much oxygen, if you put heat through there. But usually you do have a compostable product uh, in, a, in a year or two that uh, you do have to clean this out. It is not a zero discharge. There is still a liquid waste. Uh, and it's a very concentrated, highly concentrated, um, waste product that's still liquid waste product that still needs to be taken care of. There's usually a smaller holding tank that needs to be uh, pumped and removed uh, about once a year. So a composting toilet uh, is an excellent idea when you have no access to water, conventional type of a system. Um, it does require um, someone to take care of it, to go in and clean out that compost on a regular basis. 
The compost itself, again, is, is usually in a form that people will use it in their, in their gardens, and, and uh, I don't recommend that it be used for vegetables because, again, if people in that household are, are taking a lot of pharmaceuticals, the pharmaceuticals will show up in the compost. Um, as far as the reduction in nitrogen, you realize that from not introducing waste into wastewater components. Holly, do you know of any of these systems in Harwich? We have, uh, I believe we have only one. One. Again, they have not caught on in the mainstream environment. They're usually a specialty. Hang on a second. If you, and if you had two or three of these in your house or whatever, toilets like this, you also need some form of septic system or some kind of system for all the gray water, you know. Yes, stuff. you do. Yeah. You still have to have a conventional septic system for all of the other a, a flow right. within the house. You're allowed to do a reduction in design, but uh, you still do have to have uh, a system to handle that gray water. Okay, Linda, you had a question? How big a tank would you have to have in the basement doing the composting on your average house with a couple of toilets? And how it's, big is that tank? It's sized according to the number of people in the house, but it is, um, you know, it, it's not a rain barrel. It's it's larger than that. It's bigger, a few rain barrels. You know, it's several hundred, like several hundred gallons. Like an oil tank? Like an oil tank? Probably like an oil, tank? Like an oil tank, yeah. I was just trying to get I've a seen. sizing, so like an oil tank. Yeah, at least okay. in the basement. Septic system maintenance, again, I'm going to refer people, to, if you haven't had the opportunity to go to the um, health department website, we do have some, a lot of information mm -hmm. there on, and links to the DEP. We talked about pumping three to five years. Uh, pumping does not remove nitrates. So you'll hear, well, if, let's put in a mandatory pumping system so that everyone has to pump out their system every two or three years, and that will reduce the nitrogen problem. Pumping prolongs the life of the septic system. Pumping keeps the solids and grease from going over into your leaching facility and gumming that up and shortening the life of your system. It does not improve wastewater quality. Uh, don't use chemical additives. Uh, repair plumbing leaks promptly so that you are not flooding your septic system. And again, uh, I encourage you to visit the Board of Health website. We have a lot of information links to the DEP on septic system maintenance, other specialty areas about selling your property, if you need to have the real estate inspection, application forms, and a whole section on do you need a new septic system, how to get started, lists of engineers, how to. So um, I hope that people will use that website, give us a call and with any of your questions, and hopefully we can refer you to proper authorities. Thank you, Paul. And I must say that um, the feedback I've gotten from the folks that are, you know, needing septic systems or had them put in and whatnot is their, their response from your department, whether it's, you know, someone doing a perk test or someone have to inspect the system, you know, before or after it's installed has been excellent. So I think you should be proud of the fact that I mean, you and I go back years enough to know that at one time we had all these backups and things going on. And I don't mean that in the septic systems. I just mean in the you know, getting things done and whatnot, and I think your folks are responding very rapidly to um, to people's needs. So thank you very thank much. You. Any questions from the board? Yes. You know. um, You spoke about phosphorus um, just briefly. Can you tell me or all of us a little bit more about phosphorus in our tank, in our systems at home? And um, for instance, if we don't necessarily live near a freshwater pond, how it affects our water in our yard? you know, in our groundwater, leaching into the groundwater? Uh, the phosphorus is the um, food for algae in a freshwater pond area. If, if you are not, and phosphorus does not tend to travel through the um, soil as readily as nitrates. Okay. Generally, if phosphorus is traveling through uh, a porous soil like ours, it will be uh, it will cling to the soil particles, and, and sightings in the literature say that um, use figures of about 300 feet before all of the all of the phosphorus is absorbed onto the soil particles. Uh, so we've had very 
successful programs in, in uh, the nation and in Massachusetts with removing phosphorus from laundry detergents and then most recently <coughs> removing phosphorus from dishwashing detergents. So I think we are, we are reducing the lar a large amount, a good proportion of phosphorus that's going into the wastewater. The other thing is if you are around a pond it is to be careful about phosphorus in any of the fertilizer that you that you are using that will run off into the into the freshwater resource but other than that phosphorus is not as uh, linked to health problems the way that nitrates are there are um, uh, not only phosphorus in the ecological excuse me nitrogen in the ecological environment but nitrogen is also a serious um, health can have serious health effects in babies it and that's why there are also the drinking water standards in some parts of the country where there's a very large amount of naturally occurring nitrogens you will have a a disease known as um, blue baby syndrome and uh, the nitrogen can bind up into the hemoglobin of the body and rob the body of oxygen so the original standards for nitrogen in drinking water were based upon very serious health effects. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Thank Hopefully you. everybody found this worthwhile. So. It was very good.